One of the most common questions I get from people that are building their engine is what they should gap their piston rings to. Today we're going to talk about why there needs to be a gap, how to do it right, and what happens if you get it wrong. We're going to go through these instructions assuming that you've measured bore size and that you've already determined that you have the correct piston and wall clearance for your pistons. To do your ring gaps, you'll need the following. A ring file, a piston to square the rings in the bore, your second ring, your top ring, your oil rings, a set of feeler gauges, and a small jeweler's file to deburr with. In the instructions that came with your pistons, there's going to be a target piston ring and gap. That's the measurement we're shooting for. So filing the rings is pretty simple. We're going to file, we're going to measure, we're going to file, we're going to measure until we get to the ring gap that we want. Uh, during that process, I'll work with you to help you understand where it can go wrong and how to avoid problems. Before you start filing, identify which ring is the top ring and which ring is the second ring because the top ring is a harder material, so it's going to take longer to file than the second ring. You don't want to twist this around when you're loading it. This has a memory that helps uh, load the ring against the cylinder wall, so if you manhandle this, you'll bend it, break it, deform it, and it won't be any good. So before I put the uh, ring in the bore, I'll put a little bit of oil in the cylinder to help it slide. So you'll carefully load the ring into the cylinder. It doesn't take a lot of force, just your fingertips evenly compress and load it into the cylinder. And then you can use a piston ring squaring tool or the pistons you're going to use and just square the ring up in the bore. Now, from there, you can see that you have or that we have some piston ring and gap. If the rings were completely butted, you have to start filing before you get any measurement. But for us, we have something to work with. So we're just gonna use a feeler gauge and see what we have to start off with. And in this particular case, we have 21 thousandths of an inch, and we're going to end up um, at 25 thousandths of an inch. So we have four thousandths of material to remove from the ring before we get to our target clearance. So again, taking care to not damage the ring, just slide it up out of the bore, and then we can start filing. So this tool that I'm using is an inexpensive ring file. Uh, it does have these pins to locate the ring against. You want to cut in a direction that you're supporting the end of the ring. If you're dragging the file um, away from an unsupported end, then the ring is going to want to move around and flutter and it's going to be more likely to chip. So work, work with the ring loaded up against the tool so the ring has some support as it's being cut. You're going to only again work from one side of the ring gap. So don't file a little bit on this end and then file a little bit on this and go back and forth. Just file on one end of the ring until you get to your target gap. If you have access to something like this, this is an electronic filer from Total Seal. It's a really nice machine and it makes this work quite a bit easier because then you have a controlled file speed and you have a controlled feed rate. So you don't have to worry about uh, as much human error. This, you could easily ruin a set of rings with this tool. So work slowly, work carefully, and you'll have a good outcome. This, this tool I've probably had for 12, 14 years and it's not it's not the fastest way to get the job done but if you use it carefully you'll have a good outcome. You're going to file in one direction off of one side of the ring. You're going to be careful to not load the tool up against the ring so much that it can cause it to chip. So this is a, um, a motion that you're going to do very easy. You're more of trying to glide the cutter over the end of the ring instead of forcefully cut it if you use too much force, you'll damage the ring. You'll have to get another ring set. So we'll just work slowly in one direction. It doesn't take a lot. And you're going to go back, re-square the ring, and measure again. Now, when you put the ring in the, in the filing tool, you're going to make sure that you have the ring square against the cutter so you don't end up cutting taper into the end of the ring. It's, uh, it's easy to take material off and it is hard to put material back.
Some of you may be wondering how much these engines change with a torque plate. You've seen other people make the suggestion or use a torque plate during filing. Um, in my experience, it's worth uh, about a thousandth of an inch is what this block changes. And depending on how close your tuning is and how hard you're gonna run the engine, uh, you may take that thousandths up on a hot cylinder or you may not. But I don't believe that it's overly critical and the procedure can still be done pretty well without a torque plate. So we are at 24 thousandths, so we just have one more thousandths to go. Uh, the second ring is a, on this particular ring set is a uh, Napier hook. It's a much softer material than the uh, top ring, which is a nitrated steel. So the second rings cut a lot faster than the top rings. So don't get, if you get in a rhythm with your second ring and you think you found it and then you move to the top ring and you start filing and it's not going as well, uh, that's because that ring is harder or worse off, you cut the top rings first and then you go to cut the second rings and you take off too much material. Now, so this ring is now at our target gap, but if you feel around on the edge of the ring where you filed, there's a fairly sharp edge. So I just have a small jeweler's file and you can just kind of dress that and you want to get it to where you've knocked off that edge and it's just smooth. Uh, you don't want to take a lot of material off. All you're trying to do is, is file the material off that's been uh, laid over off the edge in the cutting process or the filing process. So once you have that, you can put this aside and move to the next ring. Uh, before you put these in the engine, I would clean them. Um, a lint-free paper towel and automatic transmission fluid and just kind of wipe it around to get any material off because my fingertips that ring, these tools, that block, they're all gonna have particulate that's been cut off the ring um, that you're gonna wanna get cleaned out before you put your engine together. So now we'll move to the top ring. We don't know what the gap is, so we're gonna put it in first carefully without deforming it. We're gonna square it up. We're gonna take a look. It looks like we have no clearance on the top ring. So this one's gonna require uh, a bit more filing to get to our target measurement. Um, if you have a situation where your rings have butted, um, you will have to increase the ring gap. But what you want to look for carefully, and that is, did they butt on all cylinders or on one cylinder? Because if you have a situation where you've butted the ring on one cylinder, chances are that cylinder has overheated because not all cylinders will run at the same temperature. Shown here is an example of what happens when the ring butts. The ring is no longer the same shape and it's pulled away from the cylinder wall so you can see the light between the cylinder wall and the ring, this cylinder will no longer seal. Also, this is one of the many measurements in an engine that you are better off with it um, too big than too small to avoid the butting. Once the rings butt, the ring will deform and you will lose compression and you'll have to go back into the engine to fix that. So you're better off being a little bit uh, big. A lot of tech support emails and calls we get here are based off of people having too large of a ring gap or what they think is too large of a ring gap. Um, we've run uh, many different tests to determine how much it changes um, on a forced induction engine and you're always better off on the high side of a ring gap. So some engines will have um, you know, what, what others may believe really big ring gaps. And um, because of the heat that the engine's under and the heat that the top ring sees, it can close that gap up if you're not careful. So you're always better off with a little bit more, but you can follow the manufacturer's suggestion and the instructions. And, and as long as you don't overheat the cylinder, you'll be fine.
If you notice, like I mentioned before, the top ring, harder material, it's taking more time to get to the target gap, but you're, you're not gonna rush it. This is one of the few things during the assembly process that you have uh, complete control over. You know, the rest of the stuff that was done at your machine shop, you have to trust that they've done the right thing and that they've followed their procedures correctly. But the ring gap is, if you're filing rings, it's totally up to you, so take your time and, um, and, and work slowly so you don't make a mistake for yourself. So this particular engine will see life um, at, uh, I'd say less than 1300 wheel horsepower. So we're gonna end up at um, 20 thousandths on the top ring and uh, 25 on the second. I always like to leave a four or five thousandths difference because whatever combustion makes it past the top ring needs to make it past the second ring so it doesn't get caught in between and cause the rings to flutter. Um, there are people that think that big ring end gaps can contribute to a lot of blow by. Um, I haven't seen that and we have crankcase pressure sensors on some engines and you'd be surprised what changes once it's under boost. So be careful to not butt the ring over, uh, over having a really tight gap. Okay. We're at 19. I would say if you're um, putting time aside to do this and you're using a small hand filer like I have, you're gonna want to lay, I would say two or three hours out of your day to do this uh, carefully. And, cause again, you can't put material back. So now this top ring is at its target gap. Um, we have a little bit of an edge that we're gonna just use this file and clean up a little bit to where it's smooth, you can just kind of use your fingertip. Um, the top rings on these are, uh, again, nitrated, and they're easy to chip, so you don't want to load the ring against the cutter because then you can cause the um, material to chip away at the edge and then the ring will be junk. So moving on to the rail support, uh, if your piston has a rail support like this where the pin gap uh, the pin bore goes through the oil ring. You have a rail support ring, that gap does not matter. And then you just wanna verify that your oil support rails have at least 15,000. So you can just put them in the bore. Uh, they're generally not much tension on them. And just make sure that you have at least 15,000 on that. Um, if you have to file, or if you don't have the right ring gap on the end rail, uh, you may have a boxing problem because very, very rarely do you have to modify this part. It's very thin and hard to cut. So um, go through your ring set as you open them up and make sure that you have the right stuff in order to get the job done completely. So there's one cylinder. That cylinder is now done. You can put them on the bench or table, whatever you're using, mark them for the bore that they're gonna go into. That's our number six set. And we'll now move to the number five set, so on and so forth until we get all the rings filed. So I hope this has helped answer some questions on ring gaps. If you have any questions, you can comment below or feel free to contact us. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.